It is around 9.24 in the morning on the 28th of February 1997. And police have surrounded a Bank of America in North Hollywood, LA. The officers have been called out to a suspected bank robbery and going by the gunshots emanating from within side, the suspicion is pretty strong. A body armoured clad suspect exits the bank and opens fire indiscriminately. This marks the beginning of a some 2,000 round gunfight, resulting in a complete reassessment of police armament. The event would go down in infamy as one of the most intense shootouts in recent memory. Today we're looking at the North Hollywood shootout. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. A little chat at the beginning. Before we get cracking, this video is kind of the finale of sorts of my videos on shootouts. I know it's taken a while for me to get to this one, but I kind of forgot. It's difficult keeping track of all the video subjects because me will be me. Over here, across the pond, unsurprisingly, US shootouts aren't very well known. As such, I only found out about the North Hollywood event during my research into Newhall and Miami-Dade. But oh boy, this one got me interested. It feels like a natural path to take as after each gunfight, lessons were learned and was reflected in the way police tactics and arming evolved. I don't mean here in the UK though, where having a large stick could lead to accusations of owning a deadly weapon. Now today's video got its facts and figures from contemporary news reports, the 1998 use of force review and other bits and pieces scattered around the internet, as well as some awesome news helicopter footage of the event. In 1995, a what many would consider a crime film classic would be released. And it is often brought up when talking about North Hollywood. You guessed it, the film is Heat. Apparently at the time, the shootout and the heist scene was thought to be not very realistic. However, much like many things in life, the unthinkable would become reality. Our story's main focus is the definition of life imitating art. Right, so without any more meandering, let's get started. Background So our story begins here at Gold's Gym in Pasadena, with a meeting of two men, Larry Eugene Phillips Jr., born September the 20th, 1970, and Decibel Stefan Emelian, or Emil Matesaranu, born on the 19th of July, 1966. Now, much like many parts of our story, this meeting is unclear to have actually happened. There are contradicting sources. Some say it was the Road Street Gold's Gym, but others say the one in Pasadena. I've worked with the storyline set out by the website NorthHollywoodShootout.net as the Pasadena branch was actually closer to both of the perpetrators. Regardless, both men were known to be interested in bodybuilding, and Gold's Gym, any Gold's Gym, would be an important haunt. The meeting is said to have happened somewhere between 1988 and 1989. Now, Larry Phillips Jr. was actually born under the last name Warfall in LA in 1970. This was an alias his father had adopted due to being on the run from the FBI. Larry Phillips Jr.'s early life was punctuated with his parents' times in prison. His father, Larry Sr., had multiple run-ins with the police and jail time. His mother had previously spent 10 years in prison, as well for drug-related charges before Junior's birth. Junior was moved around from LA to Denver, where he and his mum would live until their move back to LA in 1986. Larry Sr. would visit his son throughout his formative years and show him the apparent spoils of living on the other side of the law. He dropped out of school at the age of 14 and began his life of crime, starting off with a standard entry, shoplifting. But he did have... A legitimate plan for making money. This was as a real estate agent. He had studied for the test but was caught shoplifting in a Sears. He was given 12 months probation. However, his failure to put this on his real estate license application disqualified him. Instead, he decided to just go at it illegally and thus slide into the known world of fraud. This was around 1989. Now let's talk about the other half of the criminal duo, Emil. Emil Matisaranu was born on the 19th of July 1966 in Romania. In the mid-1970s, his mum would escape the Eastern Bloc, eventually followed by her son in the late 1970s. Emil would live with his mum in Altadena, just north of Pasadena. He attended college and gained a degree in electrical engineering. During this time, 
Emil and his mother operated a care home in which disabled people were boarded in the mother and son's house. His life had been plagued with issues in making friends, but he found some release in an interest in motorbikes, computers and bodybuilding. And fast forward to the period around 1988 or 1989, when Emil would find a new friend at the Gold's Gym. So both our perpetrators have met, and this meeting would lead both men down a crime-riddled path and ultimately their demise. But before the two would begin their spree of robberies, Phillips was well into his life of crime already, having been arrested for using a forged deed. In 1992, Phillips would get caught in the middle of a property scam in Denver, where he rented out vacant houses he did not own. He was arrested during a sting operation. After release in October 1992 on a $10,000 bail, the now kind of free Phillips went on the run and fled back to California where he would remain a fugitive, much like his father. A dangerous pair. On the 1st of October 1993, the pair were pulled over driving a brand new red Thunderbird. The driver, Phillips, had been speeding. Emil was in the passenger seat and the two men and the car were searched. A number of concerning things were discovered, which included a couple of AK-style weapons, body armour, explosives, three different California automobile licence plates, two sets of national armour level 3A bullet resistant vests, as well as loads of ammunition and other types of firearms. One could say they were going suited and booted for a bank robbery. They were charged. Both men would plead guilty and spend 99 and 71 days in jail respectively. They were also hit with a fine and a felony on their records and a nice additional dose of probation on top of that. After their running with the police, a number of robberies and shootouts would occur over the next couple of years. And although some are not directly proven to be Phillips and Emil, the brazen actions of the perpetrators kind of points to them. On the 14th of June 1995, a Brinks armoured car was ambushed in Winnetka, Los Angeles, killing one of its guards, a Herman Cook. On the 27th of March 1996, another Brinks car was attacked and shot up. However, the attack seemed not very well thought out and has been tenuously linked to the duo. In 1996, two more robberies were linked to the pair, but this time they graduated from armoured car hits to something much more familiar to the shootout in 1997. Both crimes were robberies of Banks of America outlets. The first one, on the 2nd of May, was at roughly 10am. Two men busted into the Van Nuys branch of the Bank of America, brandishing AK-style rifles. The two successfully got away with the money. Another similar hit happened at another branch in Winnetka. Again, AK-style weapons were involved, and two very similar-looking balaclava-wearing suspects made out successfully with the cash. In all, it is estimated that from the two Bank of America hits, the duo had gained over $1.5 million. If the attacks were Phillips and Mata Serrano, and it very likely was, then they were learning and getting more bold in their crimes. And now this leads us on to their next heist. The North Hollywood Bank Heist The duo's next target was to be the Bank of America branch located at 6600 Loyal Canyon Boulevard. Ever since May 1996, they had been planning their next hit, and this one would be a big one. They had expected to make out on their next hit with the best part of a million dollars. In the lead up to 1997, the pair had staked out the branch. It was the largest of its type in the area, and understandably, this made it a rather juicy target. It is 9.15am on the 28th of February, and a white 1987 Chevrolet celebrity pulls up outside the Loyal Canyon Boulevard Bank of America branch. The two occupants sit and synchronise their watches. They have estimated that they will have a maximum of 8 minutes before any police would reach the area. This stall on arrival would prove to be a fatal error. The two men exit the white vehicle wearing body armour and brandishing automatic style AK weapons. The time is around 9.16 in the morning. And as luck would have it, just as the two stand out in the morning breeze and begin to walk across towards the bank, in a case of bad timing, a police cruiser drives by Laurel Canyon Avenue. The two officers, Lauren Farrell and Martin Perello, are rather taken aback by what they're seeing as part of their customary look across the road to the bank. 
Two men dressed in black with body armour and assault rifles heading towards the entrance of a Bank of America branch. A call came out from the patrol car, 15A43, requesting assistance. We have a possible 211 in progress at the Bank of America. And possible was a bit of an understatement. The two men entered the Bank of America, each with their Norico Type 56 S1 rifles in hand. A customer who was leaving the bank was confronted by Phillips and Matisaranu in the ATM lobby. Finally, the person was pushed back into the bank's main entrance and onto the shop floor. The bank security guard saw this and radioed for police, but for whatever reason, the call was not received by his partner outside of the building. Upon entering the bank area of the bank, Phillips bellowed, this is a hold-up. Immediately after an opening broadside of assault rifle fire, was unleashed into the ceiling. At this moment, there are roughly 30 bank staff and customers inside the branch. The two men wanted to shock and surprise all within, in order to get the money within the eight minutes they had set for themselves. Mata Serrano opened fire on the low velocity bulletproof door that accessed the tellers and vault. When the bank was designed, they weren't really expecting someone with an assault rifle to rock up. At gunpoint, the bank's assistant manager was forced to open up the vault. For now, Pear's luck had already run out by the time they had exited their car, but it was only going to get worse. The estimated $750,000 inside was far lower, on account of the delivery roster for cash being changed. Filling their bags, they only had roughly $303,000. They attempted to open the ATMs, but again, in a case of bad luck, managers were no longer allowed to have access. And also, in a case of even more bad luck, the money they did get had been slipped with a couple of die packs, meaning that the money would soon be rendered unusable. The two men locked the customers and staff in the vault and headed out for the main exit to make their escape. Meanwhile, a small army was forming outside. At 9.24am, the gunmen had been engaged in the robbery for just under eight minutes. In their minds... They were on schedule, albeit a bit light in the takings. Upon exiting, Philip saw a police patrol car around 200 feet away. He stepped into the northwest alcove of the bank's entrance and unleashed a burst of rifle fire at the patrol cars on the junction of Archwood Street and Loyal Canyon Avenue, injuring Sergeant Dean Haynes, Officers Martin Whitfield, James Soberovan, Stuart Guy and Detectives William Krulak and Tracy Angeles. Stepping back, Phillips then sprayed some bullets at cars across the street in a car park to the west of the bank, followed by Matisaranu firing off to the north, west and south of the bank's entrance, in a form of suppressing fire. In reply, a couple of shotgun blasts came out from the police, now taking cover. Phillips retreated back into the bank. I'm assuming this was to reload, as just a few seconds later he re-emerged and again fired at the car park across the street. Return fire from handguns and service revolvers did little to slow down the gunman. The police lacked the stopping power required to penetrate the suspect's body armour. Firefighters set up a care centre on the Victory Boulevard to the west of the bank to treat the growing numbers of injured officers. The exchange in gunfire continued, with shotgun blasts landing a hit on Phillips, but it was little to stop the raging gunman. Both men re-entered the bank and shortly re-emerged with a bag of money. A short exchange of fire ensued, then Matisarano laid down covering fire, and Phillips made his way northwards towards the car park and their waiting getaway car. Officers spotted Phillips as he dumped the money back next to the car and went to the boot to retrieve some more weapons and ammunition. Matisarano then followed up 30 seconds later, but as he turned the corner to the car park, he was struck in the head with a glancing 9mm round. Although a headshot, it wasn't a killing shot. Matisaranu fell on the bonnet of the white Chevy celebrity. Matisaranu was hit a few more times in his leg and arm. Twelve seconds later, he entered the car and started the engine. Phillips had begun firing back at the police, but their situation was leaving them out in the open. He was hit in the arm as he moved to the passenger side of the Chevy. He discarded his rifle, and after grabbing a new one, Phillips moved behind a parked lorry. Matis Serrano drove the white Chevy down Archwood Street. Meanwhile, Phillips was hit a couple more times. He drew a Beretta 92FS pistol after his rifle jammed. 
After being shot in the arm, the pistol was dropped, but Phillips bent over to reach it. Next, he raised the pistol to his chin and pulled the trigger. As Phillips dropped back down to the ground, multiple shots from police officers hit him. As he lay on the floor, lifeless, the police were taking no chances and the body continued to receive bullet hits. Meanwhile, shots were hitting the white Chevy Matis Rani was driving. Eventually, it gave out. Escaping the stricken vehicle, he tried to steal a yellow Jeep. The driver fled after being shot at. Unfortunately for Matis Rani, the owner had operated a hidden kill switch. He was trapped and his time was running out. He fled the Jeep and took cover behind the Chevrolet after which he engaged in a two and a half minute shootout with police. By now, the SWAT team had arrived and some police had borrowed some AR-style rifles from a nearby gun store. Matis Serrano shot through the Chevrolet blindly. One of the police managed to get a shot at the gunman from underneath the car, hitting him in the legs. Quickly enough, and very much shot to pieces and bleeding, he put his hands up to surrender. Police and SWAT team members moved in covering Matis Ranu, kicking his weapon away from him and kicking him onto his front to spread eagle his arms and legs. He had been shot 29 times and understandably severely injured. He would bleed for just over an hour lying on the floor next to the white Chevrolet. Ambulance workers were not allowed to approach the gunman due to the area not being declared cleared. At around 11am, Matis Serrano took his last breath. The North Hollywood shootout was now over and both suspects lay dead on the tarmac. The area wouldn't be fully cleared until 13 hours after the shootout. In total, an estimated 2,000 rounds had been fired and buildings, cars and curbs were riddled with bullet holes. 12 officers and 8 civilians were injured in the shootout and on top of that, both perpetrators were dead. The event was hard to ignore as to how the gunmen managed to pretty much take on a small army for so long. It was estimated around 300 police officers of various departments had been scrambled on alert across LA. Aftermath The perpetrated bodies were post-mortemed, and gunshot wounds were rather unsurprisingly given as the cause of death. Once the identities were found, a number of properties were raided, in which around $400,000 was recovered, in addition to multiple weapons and body armour. During the raids, Matis Serrano's business address was searched and a 44-year-old disabled person was found. They had been living in an unlicensed converted care home. Georgia Mayo was their name and she had been left uncared for in her bedroom. She was removed and assessed in hospital and found to be severely malnourished. So the event would cause the LAPD to rethink their tactics and more importantly, the arming of their officers. A use of force report to the police commissioner on the North Hollywood shootout would be written and would go through the event minute by minute. And I'd really recommend checking it out to read yourself. Anywho, as a stopgap, around 600 surplus M16 rifles were given to the LAPD. This was from the Department of Defence and officers on the beat were allowed to carry 45 ACP pistols. Something that was only reserved for SWAT teams prior to the shootout. Nationwide, police would be better armed and the event would entwine itself into American culture and arguably be one of the many reasons why American police have things like this. Saying that, a couple of those I think the Met would find handy in London. Now today there is no disaster scale for this one or a bingo card, but I'll dust off the old legacy scale and it's probably going to be a 9, I reckon. Uh, do you agree? This is a Play Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Play Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently quite nice corner of southern London, UK. I have Instagram, a second YouTube channel, a band camp, and Twitter, or X, or whatever the hell they're calling it today. So check all of them out for the music from this video, or for just other random bits and pieces of things I'm getting up to outside of the world of Plainly Difficult. I'd like to say a very warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for your financial support as you'll really help keep the lights on here and the rest of you for tuning in every week to watch my videos and listen to me talk. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching and Mr Music, play us out please. <laughs>